Okay, so let's have a look at some cryptography fundamentals. So as part of this, we're going to look at some traditional ciphers before we go on to our key-based encryption. So these are ciphers that we've used in the past and were fairly successful, but obviously these days we tend to be using key-based encryption. And I'll explain later on what key-based encryption actually means. One of the methods that we can use to be able to crack our traditional ciphers is to use what's called frequency analysis. And it's a useful technique that we can use in many applications. And then the operators that we use in encryption are fairly simple. Uh, Exclusivor uh, is one of our operators. Um, and bit shifting or bit rotation. Then an, a method that we'll come across a little bit later in the module is uh, the greatest common denominator, GCD. The values that we have, uh, we convert plain text into ciphertext and then into plain text again. And we need a way to represent our plain text and also our encryption keys. So for that, we'll look at the basic encoding formats that we can have. Hexadecimal and Base64 are two of the most popular types uh, that represent our binary information in a form that we can interpret. And then in cryptography, we often don't deal with these small 32-bit or 64-bit numbers. We could be dealing with 4,096-bit uh, numbers. These are defined as big integers, and they're not your normal type of integers that we would use in a, in a program. An important concept is, is random numbers. We use this to be able to make sure that uh, every time we run our cryptography, we get something different. And also, we want to be able to uh, generate our encryption keys. Then finally, we'll look at what's called key-based encryption. Okay, so here we are again, uh, Bob and Alice. And we want to make sure that they can communicate without Eve eavesdropping or changing the communication or pretending to be either Bob or Alice. Okay, so as we'll find later, we also need uh, a trend. And so these are some of the people that have really built the foundation of our, our modern cryptography. Overall, it goes back to the 1950s um, when uh, ciphers were first created but one of the most significant uh, advancements happened at the end of the 1970s and that was when Whitfield Diffie and Marty Hellman created the Diffie-Hellman method. This allowed a key, a secret key, to be uh, generated by Bob and Alice without Eve finding out what the key is. This is known as the Diffie-Hellman method and it was a major advancement at the time. Then the search was on for a public key encryption method. Is it possible to have one key that we can encrypt and then with a different key we can decrypt? This is known as public key encryption or asymmetric encryption. A public key can encrypt and a private key or a secret key can decrypt. That was cracked by Rives, Shamir and Edelman uh, around the end of the 1970s. Whitfield Diffie and Marty Hellman had proposed the opportunity that we could create what's called a trapdoor function in our uh, public key methods. And it was Rives, Shamir and Edelman with RSA that was the first uh, method to be defined for public key encryption, the first usable one. And over 40 years have passed and it's still well used. Much of the internet is secured for its identity using RSA. Ron went on to create many uh, uh, ciphers and hashing codes, MD5, MD6 and so on. He also created RC, Ron Cipher, RC4, RC5 and RC6. So he really advanced the areas of hashing and symmetric key encryption. Phil Zinnemann uh, proposed that there must be a more secure method that we can have to be able to send email. So he integrated the methods of public key encryption 
hashing and symmetric key encryption into his PGP pretty good pretty good privacy encryption method. Bruce Snyder is someone who has created uh, many uh, uh, useful symmetric key methods such as two fish, blowfish, uh, and and so on, and writes a, a lot of uh, uh, writes up a lot of articles and in, in his blog. NIST defined a new standard for uh, symmetric key encryption. They have competitions at various times, and they had one for a standard method of uh, symmetric key encryption. Before this, the industry used what was called DES, or Data Encryption Standard, and it kind of dated back to the 1950s and 1960s. Unfortunately, it had a small key which could be cracked. So this ran a competition for a new standard, and the Rindal method was the one that was picked, uh, and it was created by these two researchers here. It is now known as the AES encryption method. NIST have advanced on to create new hashing methods, uh, new lightweight crypto cryptography methods, and also recently with post-quantum cryptography methods. Okay, so let's look at our traditional ciphers. So as we should all know, we can get, there are many ways to, to send secret messages the quilt codes here actually had a, a, a map embedded into the quilt code which would allow the, the, the captive person a route to escape. Microfiche has obviously been used for years and that's where we can shrink down our images to a very small image. And the Navajo code talkers in, the, in World War uh, uh, used to uh, cipher messages. And smoke signals, although they're not a, a, an encryption method or a cipher method, uh, can send secret messages. We would define this as an encoding method rather than a, a secret cipher. Okay, so what we have is that we can have a special algorithm called an encoder to take the plain text and convert it into cipher text. We can then have a decoder to be able to decode it back or just do the reverse of the encoder to send it back to plain text. As long as Eve doesn't know what the encoding and the decoding is, then she might not be able to uh, uh, decrypt or decipher the cipher text. An encoding method that we, that we have or has been around for a long time is Morse code. With this, we represent our uh, our characters, only uh, uppercase characters in this case, uh, with a dot or a dash. So in this case, we have an A as a dot and a dash, and an X as a dash, dot, dot, dash. So we see here, uh, three uh, dots represents an H, and there's a small space, pause in between, and then an E, and then so on. So there are gaps in between uh, to make sure that we can differentiate our, our uh, characters and also the, at the end of a paragraph. In this case, we have uh, an N, you see, a U, F, and a C, and so on. Okay, this is known as a, an encoding method rather than as a cipher. One cipher that we can use is to be able to create a two-dimensional grid and then map our characters onto there. Uh, five by five will cover most characters, but we will have to overload the one for one of the entries. Hopefully we'll be able to determine whether it's a Y or a Z. So in this case, we have a two and a three, which is an H, a one and a five, which is an E, and so on. So not a great cipher, but certainly a way to be able to encode our messages. A graphical cipher is one where we can actually map out 
uh, the the graphics of the uh, the cipher text rather than than using uh, numbers or or characters. In this case, we draw out our grid and we have a dot sometimes here, and there's the dot there. So in this case, we have a square with a dot, so that's an N. We have a, an angle L there, that's an A. Then this one here is a P, that's an N. This one here is this I, and then a square with a dot is an E. And then we have this character here, which is an R. So we can see here that we can actually create our ciphertext using a graphical method. And this is an example here of the headstone of James Leeson, in, who died in 1792, which actually has a, a, what's called the Freemason cipher. This is known as the pig pen cipher. And a code that was used, and uh, similar with a grid code, is the ADFGVX format. And in this case, we take two, ca two characters at a time, the F and the D, FD, and that's a K. And then we have the G, I, the V, R and so on. A more complex code was created by, uh, by uh, Charles Wheat Wheatstone. He created a cipher which was then named after Lord Playfair. With this, we now get the concept of having a key. So the key is shared between Bob and Alice, say, and uh, we will encode or cipher a message using the key and then it can be decrypted with the same key. So in this case we, re we, we have a cipher key of Napier Run, Napier UN, and we would lay out the characters in sequence without repeating them and then lay the characters back out for the ones that are still uh, to be used. This gives us a grid. We then take two characters at a time, and for this we draw a square around it, and we take the characters which are at either end of the square. So in this case, we will take A and the T, and it becomes N, E. T and an A, this is the other way around, and it becomes E, M. And then in the last one, we, we have a, a K, and a T. This relates to the uh, the operation of looking at the next row within the column. Okay, in this way we can actually create our cipher from our plain text. One of the first ciphers that was used was used by uh, Caesar, or known as a Caesar cipher. In this case we shift the alphabet. The plain text is in lowercase and the ciphertext is in uppercase in this case. So in this case, we've moved it one, one, two, three places along. So an A is a D and so on. So in this case, our cipher K is an H and an H is an E and L is a, an O is an L, L and then O there. So there aren't too many ciphers that we can have. We can have 26, but obviously one of them will look the same. So we only have 25 ciphers, so it's not very secure. But actually this person here used uh, this type of cipher to be able to store some secret uh, information. An improved cipher is to be able to scramble the alphabet so if Caesar and Cleopatra in this case know what the, the scramble is, then it's possible, it might not be possible for Mark Antony here to be able to discover what the, the, the mapping is. So in this case we have an L, which is an I, a Q, which is Q, let me find Q, 
you. Is here, there's an N, and then N is a key, I think it says inkwell. So how many ciphers do we have now? Well, we can have 26 for the first position. Once we pick that, we can have 25 for the second position, and so on. So the number of code mappings is known as 26 factorial, or 26 times 25, and so on. This gives us this many codes and even the best computer in the world will take years and years, if not centuries, uh, to be able to crack that cipher. But luckily, we can crack it using frequency analysis. And the way we do it is that we know the most common letters and the least common letters. And what we can do is do a frequency analysis of the cipher to be able to match them either to their probability of their occurring the probability of the two characters, probability of three characters together, and of words. We can see here that the is the most common uh, word, followed by of, and then and. Okay, so let's give that a try, and we'll see if we can crack a cipher. Okay, so let's just try one. So here's our cipher here. And here are the probabilities of the letters that are in there. And what we'll see, this is the normal text. There's an E, the most popular. But in our cipher, it looks like the T or an A, sorry, a T. Just let us see again. It looks like an H is the most popular uh, character in there. We'll just check. And H occurs 11.5% of the time. So it's occurring quite often. And E in normal English will occur 12.6% times. So looks like we've, we've identified what an E is. Okay, so I've mapped out the most popular one letter words. It's either an A or an I typically. These are the most popular uh, two letter words and these are the most popular three letter words and for this I've outlined the the occurrence of these so in this case KHA occurs 17 times in there so there's a very good chance that is a the okay but we'll give it a try so we think then H is an E okay so there we go and we think that an R is an A. So we'll try R as an A. Okay, so now we think that a K is a T. And we think that an A could be an H. Okay, so hopefully we're starting to see some characters in here. Uh, so we can go in and see if we can find the next, or we can see if there's any patterns. So in this case, there's some two letter words, three letter words, and so on. Okay, so if we look at our cipher, so this looks, this could be a, a we already picked off our T. So the J looks like an S. So we'll try that one. Okay. And uh, this could be an H or a W, so we've already used the H, so we think that Q is likely to be a W. Q, Q as a W. And I assume that is an L as an I, and an O as an N.
Okay, it looks like a C with an R. Yes, sometimes we can have problems <laughs> with the cipher, but hopefully you'll be able to see these problems. So a W looks like a V. Yeah. And an E looks like an O. As long as we're getting them mostly right, then we should be able to spot a Z looks like an F. And this looks like defend, so a D is a D. Okay, this looks like a C, N is a C. Depth, G is a P. And we can actually start to see all of the letters mapping out there. <laughs> the U looks like an I looks like a U. But unfortunately there. Fortunately as S looks like an L and an M looks at like a Y. And Y looks like an M. And B and X is a B. Chapter one, the concept of defense and depth where a defense system has many layers, unfortunately, as in military systems uh, using, so G P is a G. P is a G, and B is a K, and have we got all the letters, we're only less with the non-popular ones, J, Q, X, and Z, there, D, N, Z, so an F, an F is a Z. There might not be some characters in here, so it might be a bit difficult to find them. I think we've now mapped every character there, and we can now read the message. So you can see that's a very difficult cipher to crack by brute force, but if we use frequency analysis, it becomes relatively easy to be able to, to crack that. Okay, so that's how we cracked it. We use frequency analysis to be able to analyze the frequency of the uh, of the characters in the in the message. Another method that we can use to add a key is to use a visionaire code. With this, what we do is that we take the uh, a key and then we apply it to uh, the row. So if we have a key of green, then the first key, the first row is a G. So we map our cipher, hello, to an N in this case. We then have the next row is an R. Uh, that the R then, the E then becomes a V, and so on. And this way, repeated characters will not are not likely to come out the same when if we have different letters in our key. A perfect cipher is what's called a one-time pad. In this case, Bob and Alice uh, both generate a code book that they share, and then uh, Bob will take the letters and define the character count to be able to find the characters. When he sends it over, Alice then looks at the code book and then is able to decrypt it. But we can only use the code book once and we need to regenerate it. So perhaps we could generate a different one every day or with a different secret, we could generate a new cipher. 
Another uh, cipher that we can use is homophonic ciphers. In this case, we overload the characters that are the most popular with more codes to make them happen with an equal frequency as the other characters. In this case, when we have an E, we'll take 25. The next time we use it, we'll have 26 and so on. And then when Eve is analysing the cipher, it won't be possible for her to pick off through fre frequency analysis the characters. OK, so that was a coverage of traditional ciphers. Uh, let's now have a look at how we encode our characters. With this, what we do is that we uh, encode them into a bind we encode from a binary format into a format that we can interpret. So typically we have uh, ASCII characters. So the ASCII characters here, A, is represented by this bit pattern. So when we display them, we would display them as the character and not as the, the bit values that we see here. But when we cipher, we will convert it into non often into non-printable characters. So it's not, we can't really represent them back as these characters here. So the way we do this is to be able to represent them in a form which we can print. And the two main forms that we have is hexadecimal and base64. Those convert our binary values into text or printable uh, characters. With hexadecimal, we take four bits at a time and we convert them into our uh, hex value. So a 10 is an A and a 15 is an F. So in this case we have a 1 and a 4 which is 5. We have a 2, a 4 and an 8 which is 14 which is an E. Okay. With B64 we take our 8 bits and we split them up into six bits at a time and then we end up with a little runt at the end. So in this case we have a 1, a 2, 4, an 8 and a 16. So that ends up as 25 or a Z. So we take each six character values, there are 64 characters here, and we will represent them with a, with a, a base 64 character. With this we need a multiple of, if we, we will pad with zeros at the end here to make sure they fill six bits. And you see the last one is an A. But we need to fill up a multiple of four. So we pad with an equals to be able to make sure that we have four, eight, 12, 16 characters and so on. So we can often identify base64 Typically because it has equals at the end, either one equals or two equals. Sometimes it will have none. Okay, so we can represent our values that we have quite simply. If we take a character string, then we can represent it in hex or base64. And here is our binary value. If possible, we can convert from base64 to ASCII. ASCII is a standard character set that we typically use, and, and so on. The operations that we use for encryption are really quite simple, and we don't want to lose in, any information. So the two basic operations that we have is exclusive OR, which is uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, gives us 0, 1, 1, 0, a basic adder circuit. And the other one that we have is a rotate. We rotate our bits uh, one way or the other. So this is a rotate left and the rotate right is the other way. And the bits that come off the end will go on, on the start again. The good thing with exclusive OR is that when we exclusive OR, in this case we get these values, and we exclusive OR again, we get the same value back again if we, if we exclusive OR it with the same value. Another operation that we'll see 
later on is called the mod operation. And with this, we do a divide, an integer divide, but we're only interested in the remainder. So in this case, 143 divided by 5 is 28, remainder, remainder 3. So the result of this operation is, is, is 3. And with Python, we can do this quite easily. So let's see. And we'll run our Python. If we take a equal to 153 and b equal to, say, 13, then we can print a mod b, oops, a mod b, which is 10. Uh, so in Python, the percent is the mod operator and it gives us a, a remainder. And this is very important when we look at public key encryption. We can also represent our values in lots of different ways as 8-bit values, ASCII, as 16-bit values and UTF-16. Obviously, we have different character sets for different languages. Uh, we can represent them as a decimal number, as a hexadecimal number, as an octal number, or as an HTML uh, code. These are all valid ways of us representing our bit patterns as a character. Some of the non-printable ones that we get, a new line is a 13, uh, a carriage return is a 10. That's what we get at the end of a line of text. Tab is 7, backspace 9, and a space is hexadecimal 20 or 32 in, in decimal. Okay, we'll find in cryptography that to make it difficult for a machine, we often have lots of something, such as lots of keys, or we give the computer a hard problem to solve. When we look at public key encryption, we'll find the factorization of a big number into two prime numbers is actually quite a difficult task for it to solve if the prime numbers are large enough. Okay, so Later on, we'll look at how we can factorize our values into two uh, values. One uh, operator we'll see later on is what's called the greatest common denominator, and that finds out the largest value that can divide into both of the values that we have. Often, we're after a GCD of one, which means that the two values do not share uh, uh, a factor. And when we do our cryptography, we often, with our normal integer values, go up to about 64 bits, which gives us this range here. But in cryptography, we can go up much larger. This is a 240-bit number, and we often use 4096 bits, which is an, a massive number, if we can actually show here. Let me find this. Okay, so you can see here these are the large numbers. So 2 to the power of 2048 gives us this number. Luckily, Python does this really well. So if we do 2 to the power of 2048, we'll see that Python is able to compute large numbers uh, plus one gives us that times times two and so on so python copes with these uh, numbers very well but some of the languages we uh, have to use a big int uh, type in this case we have golang which needs to convert the values into what's called the big integer and then we can do our, our operations on these values. And later on, we'll find out that we often use a mod p operation. So we can see that we get some very large values uh, for our operations. Then we need random numbers. We can either have true random numbers 
which come from a random source, such as electrical noise in a circuit, or we can have what's called pseudo-random, where we have a sequence of random numbers that we hope don't repeat quite soon, uh, but they are deterministic. We, we, we can predict the values coming along. For this, we need a seed value, which will start off the pseudo-random number and will give us a certain sequence after that. So in lotteries and draws, we need true random numbers, where in simulation, we need pseudo-random number generators. Another code that we can use is what's called CRC32, and it's often used in what's called error correcting codes. So it takes uh, a string or characters and it will create a little code for us to be able to find out if any of the characters have actually changed in the message. Okay, so the problem with our standard algorithm is that if Eve discovers it, then really it's easy for her to be able to break the cipher. So often what we do is that we use a standard encryption algorithm that Eve knows about, but we will generate a key, and that key will be unique between Bob and Alice and will change the cipher. So we have plain text, cipher text, and then plain text. Only with the key that we use uh, can we actually decrypt the cipher. The methods that we use for symmetric key encryption, that's the same key on the other side, is RC4, RC2, DES, 3DES and AES. And we'll cover these later on in the module. For public key encryption, we use two different keys, a public key and a private key. And they, will, they can work either way. One encrypts and the other one will decrypt. RSA, DSA, our typical methods here. And then we can have a one-way hash where we can only go mathematically one way and we can't reverse. MD5, SHA1, SHA2, SHA3 are typical hashing methods. But we'll find that we can actually reverse it uh, using uh, tools such as Hashcat. So how safe is the key? Well, we can, if we have four bits, then it's possible to have 16 different keys. When we look at our keys, we can take the number of bits and actually derive the number of keys that we have. So for 64 bits, we have that number of keys. Okay, so in the next unit, we'll be looking at uh, these encryption keys and determining our symmetric key encryption.